In this video, we are uncovering the hidden gems in your fantasy drafts after round 10. And in my six years of covering fantasy football as my full-time job, this is exactly where we excel, finding those league winners in the later rounds. So here are those seven later round gems that you need to be targeting in your drafts. And we'll start with a rookie who is actually rising up draft boards pretty quickly right now. It's the Chargers rookie running back, Kamani Vidal. And if we look at the fantasy pros ADP, Vidal is currently going as the 148th overall player. So it fits our criteria. He's going after round 10. He's going right now in round 13 but this is a guy who's a fifth round rookie so this is somewhat high for a fifth round rookie running back to be going the 13th round of drafts normally these guys if they're even drafted it's in like super deep leagues like round 19 round 20 because usually multiple things have to happen for that running back to pay off and one of those things is to land in a favorable spot which is exactly what Vidal happened for him and you can see right here he's on the chargers but there's a couple of guys in front of him two veterans in front of him but he again like I said a favorable spot both of these guys are aging veterans they're both new to the Chargers. Chargers. This will be their first year there. They're both coming over from the Baltimore Ravens and they both have their own, you can say, durability concerns. Now, Gus Edwards will probably be the lead back on this team. He was paid the most money. He has the most recent track record for success in the NFL because fr quite frankly, he's just stayed healthier compared to J.K. Dobbins. But that being said, as of right now, Gus Edwards is dealing with an undisclosed injury in camp. He's also 29 years old, so not young. And then the only other key piece in this backfield is going to be J.K. Dobbins, who signed a deal for just $50,000 guaranteed relative to NFL backup running backs. And normally they get two to three to four to five million dollars guaranteed and he's coming off of a torn achilles from week one of last year which normally at the very least is 12 to probably closer to 18 months to get back your full recovery meaning that he might not be right at any point this season and we just don't have a good track record of running backs coming back from torn achilles i mean people will point to cam Akers as you can see right here he came back in a year in 2021 the same year but he didn't really do anything in the postseason and then in his next year 2022 if we look at the game logs on player profiler look at his stats you can see right here he doesn't put up any points and we we'll scroll over to it he doesn't doesn't put up any points in week one then he gets eight points then he gets 10 then one then three then zero then two like this is a brutal performances right but he comes on in the later part of the season a top 10 finish a top number one overall finish a couple of top 15 finishes right here but that was all the way in week 10 and 11 and now Dobbins timeline is similar to Akers he might he might not be fully ready until like weeks eight or ten which is why people are starting to get excited about Vidal a little bit more and the other reason people are getting excited is because of the new coach you have Jim Harbaugh known to like to run the ball I mean last year in college at Michigan it's a totally different thing it's Michigan they were built with an offensive line and a run game and it's college football but he ran the ball 37 times per game and his new offensive coordinator is Greg Roman who every single year of his career he ranks top 10 in neutral run rate as an offensive coordinator or a coach meaning they're just going to run the ball a lot probably not as much as people expect them to but they're probably going to rank in the top 10 in run rate now look Jim Harbaugh is an old school coach and so is Greg Roman they're not gonna, just going to trust a fifth round rookie immediately to pass protect for Justin Herbert and to not fumble the ball and to be in there in key situations he's going to have to earn that role in preseason camp and probably the early part of the season but as for Kamani V Dahl himself he actually has a really nice profile I mean if we just look at his overall size he's 5'8 he's 213 pounds pretty nice size maybe a little bit short for the running back position but the overall build is nice he has strength if we pull up his college profile last year in college he had over 1600 rushing yards he actually led every single running back in the country and it was at a small school against weaker competition at Troy but you can see here he led every running back in the country with over 1600 yards right down here 1661 you scroll over he was also able to catch passes as well multiple seasons three of 20 plus receptions over 200 yards there so over 1800 total yards and then he shows up to the nfl combine and this is where he kind of gets on the map a little bit more people are looking more into the prospects as their full-time job anyway so more reports come out but he runs a 446 at 213 pounds with a nice background of everything i just showed being able to produce and maybe the big one and the reason why he could actually turn into uh maybe a serviceable player or a guy that players or coaches can trust like a jim harbaugh is the guy can pass protect and that is massive that's the thing that gets you on the field in third downs and now with cam coming we're already starting to get some positive quotes from front some of the coaches from the general manager you can see right here this is everything in here if you wanted to freeze it and just kind of zoom in and say what the coach speak index has here everything is basically stating just how great this player is how versatile he is he makes guys miss he can take a hit he stays on his feet great bounce i mean he's basically a guy who can break tackles he has the strength and do a lot after the catch as well as a pass catcher and the interesting thing is like this chargers offense it's not the same offense that we remember in the past it's not going to be that offense that you can rely on old time playmakers because they're no longer there right here on the team changes page which is just one small piece of the fantasy blueprint that i created you can see every single team's key key changes on offense look at the guys that they lost they lose gerald everett starting tight end they lose their starting receivers in mike williams and keenan allen they lose their starting running back in austin eckler all the playmakers are gone and when you have this prospect that's a playmaker maybe the most exciting player in this backfield comparing him to gus Severns and jk dobbins there's a decent chance that it's easier for him to at least stand out in practice compared to those other guys and get the coach's attention more so i like vidal's profile in round 13 if indeed one guy goes down ahead of him or he just looks that great 
State in camp and the preseason. In round 13, I think he could be one of these league winners. Now, next up, I want to talk about a Packers rookie who also pretty impressive himself last year was a fifth round pick by the team. And look, the numbers don't do it justice how good this guy was last year. The guy played in all three wide receiver positions and pretty consistently at times was earning snaps on the outside over guys like Romeo Dobbs and even the more exciting rookie for many people last year, the second rounder in Jaden Reed. And Wicks ranked 24th in yards per route run as a rookie and fourth at win rate against man coverage in the entire NFL. And not only that, but according to Reception Perception, it's a site created by Matt Harmon and many others are, are contributors to it. It's a fantastic website. You can check it out. Man coverage last year. This is how Dontavian Wicks fared. Over 72% of the time, he had success against man coverage, which for a rookie, and, and considering he's a fifth round rookie, this is really impressive. If you're over 70%, it's a strong indicator of your future success in the NFL. And also according to Reception Perception, 59% of the time he broke at least one tackle and 25% of the time he broke at least two tackles. This guy is great after the catch. And whenever a rookie gets compared to Devontae Adams, and of course he's wearing the same jersey, the Packers jersey, but when he gets compared to Devontae Adams in his rookie season, you have to take notice of this, especially when he's going in round 13. You can see right here, one pick after Kamani Badal we just talked about, and he's going as the wide receiver 63. Do I believe that there are 62 wide receivers that have the same amount of upside as Dontamian Wilkes? Definitely not. Especially when we consider that he's going as the fourth Packers receiver right now. Jaden Reed goes ahead of him, Christian Watson and Romeo Dobbs in that order. And honestly, besides Christian Watson, who I do believe should be going ahead of him, I do believe is the Packers true number one receiver. And if he has indeed fixed his hamstring issues that I'm currently, as we're speaking, trying to fix my own right now, it's been months. But if he hasn't, I might have to call him up. If he has fixed those issues, I think he's the number one receiver. But I think Wicks should be going, in all honesty, ahead of Jaden Reed and Romeo Dobbs. And that's going to sound crazy to many people. And that doesn't mean that you're taking Dontavian Wicks in round seven ahead of those guys around eight. No, just get the value that you can and soak it up in round 13. And I've talked about my reasoning before, but Jaden Reed was a slot receiver last year for this team. He was not on the field in two wide receiver sets when Watson was healthy. Dontavian Wicks was playing over Jaden Reed in two wide receiver sets. So was Romeo Dobbs. And if you're telling me that all we have to do is get Dontavian Wicks to beat out Romeo Dobbs, which he played better than him last year, and this has even been kind of noted by Matt LaFleur that they have to get him on the field more, I'll kind of take my bets that he can do that. So for his price tag in round 13 and the upside that he could be a starter and potential number one receiver for a Jordan Love, I'll just take the cheapest Packers receiver right now in round 13. Now, next up, this one might get some grunts and groins because Deshaun Watson for a lot of people in the past and even still is public enemy, enemy number one and rightfully so I mean look if we're if we just want to put on our fantasy goggles and like this just feels weird to say so but if we're just trying to analyze and that's what I do fantasy football and not everything that comes out of that right I feel like I have to put this disclaimer out there well I do think that Deshaun Watson is indeed again just tunnel vision to fantasy football, which again, seems weird. I do believe that he's a solid fantasy pick to good fantasy pick. Because right now, if you look at where Deshaun Watson goes, who normally in the past, just like one to two years ago, was every single time a top five or top 10 quarterback, he's currently going as the quarterback 21. That's this number over here, 130th overall player. He goes after guys like Aaron Rodgers. I think that's a mistake. Matthew Stafford. I definitely think that's a mistake. Kirk Cousins. I can see you wanting Kirk Cousins over him, but I'm still not all that interested. He's going in a tier right now with guys like Will Levis and Baker Mayfield. And to me, he's nowhere near these guys, at least his upside if we're trying to get a guy late and that's what we're shooting for their upside way above these other guys now look i know the reason why people won't like him there's the obvious reasons of off the off the field issues but also these last couple of years how can you rely on him right he didn't play in all of 2021 and then in 2022 only plays six games 2023 only plays six games because of suspensions as well as injuries so we've only seen the guy play 12 games in the last three seasons of course from 2020 when he was one of the best quarterbacks and fantasy quarterbacks ever it's a long way since then entering the 2024 season but i do want to point out that last year this browns team led the entire nfl in pace of play they ran the most plays part of that was because there were some overtime games and they were trailing they might not be trailing as much this year since uh, they don't have joe flacco and no nick chubb but the offense if we look right here ranked fourth in overall passing plays per game 37 per game and now some of those things i mentioned not having joe flacco anymore not having nick chubb it kind of led to this offense that was going to just lean more pass first and now they have an offseason to kind of adjust but really not too much has changed overall to, for us to think that they're not going to still rank top 10 in plays per game because they still have the same coaching staff that wants to play quick and now maybe if they don't have nick chubb back maybe some people are now saying at all this season well maybe they have to just throw a little bit more especially since their starting quarterback and watson is back on the field and if we were to just look at player profilers game logs from last year yeah watson didn't finish all that great but it's kind of skewed again he only played in six games he had a top five finish in his first game then there there was this stinker right here right 27th overall but then a top 10 finish then he leaves a game early with injury right here he puts up negative one fantasy points then a top 10 finish and a 14th finish so he played in four out of five games healthy and in four of those five games he put up top 14 finishes with three top 10 finishes and now the real life efficiency wasn't the greatest at all but he just did enough in terms of passing volume touchdowns and the little bit of mobility that he did flash still last year that enough was able to get those top 10 
and finishes. And that also you have to keep in mind that last year this offensive line was not healthy. I mean, some of their biggest pieces in Wyatt Teller and guys like Jack Conklin, Jedrick Willis, these guys were injured at times last year, if not for like the majority of the season. And now these guys are healthy coming into this year. It should be a top five offensive line as we head into 2024. And the thing that I mentioned earlier about the upside of Watson compared to the other quarterbacks who go in his range, if we pull those guys up again, like a Baker Mayfield, like a Rodgers, like a, a Matt Stafford, the thing here is that Watson was a mobile quarterback in the past. If he's trailing more in games this year, he's going to see that mobility. He flashed last year 15th in rushing yards per game. So above average, in my opinion, 24 rushing yards per game, only one rushing touchdown in those five healthy games. But I think this is a guy that can get back to the 28 to 35 rushing yards per game, ranked top 10 in that category. And you're getting that type of guy this late in drafts. I think he is the latest quarterback right now. He goes outside the top 20 with legitimate upside to help you win leagues. Now, the next guy I want to talk about is in a backfield that has no solid running back one, and he's going pretty cheap in drafts, which is usually an appealing spot to target. And this running back is currently going as the 155th overall guy. He's going outside easily the top 50 running backs, and it is currently Jaleel McLaughlin, who Jaleel McLaughlin, if you're not familiar, is a Denver Broncos running back, comes out of Youngston State right here. He's just a 23-year-old running back in his second year in the NFL, and there's a lot of opportunity for a talented player like this in a backfield that has no clear-cut running back one. And if you're not familiar with Jaleel McLaughlin, because many people might not be, this is a guy who leads all of college football in college fo football history in rushing yards. Now, he did this at a smaller school, but it's still impressive because he's not like this 230-pound running back. He's 190 pounds, and he averaged over seven yards per touch in his college career. And in his rookie season, he was constantly getting praise from Sean Payton. You can see Coach Speak Index last year, Sean Payton in this video, basically saying that, yeah, the guy has to start to get more snaps, and he slowly got that, right? Last year to start the season, got one touch, like five snaps, and it slowly piled up. 21% of the snaps, 33% of the snaps. This might not sound like a lot, 10 touches in that game as well, but this is important because this was an undrafted rookie out of Youngston State, a, an extremely small school. So there was something that Sean Payton liked about him, and it makes sense. He was extremely athletic and productive. I mean, the fellow last year, they trusted him to 76 carries, 36 targets. This resulted in about 30 catches. He had over 100 total targets last season. If we pull up his efficiency numbers, top 10 in the NFL in yards per touch, top five in overall yards per carry on the ground. You look at his broken tackle rate, sixth in the NFL. You look at his breakaway runs, 13th in the NFL. Like this isn't a guy who just had like 10 carries and was great. No, he had over 100 touches and ranked as a top 10 running back in efficiency and productivity per touch in the entire NFL. Like that's how good this guy was last year. And now he's not the biggest or most explosive runner, but he does have speed. And like guys like Devon A. Chain and Keaton Mitchell last year in their rookie years, these smaller backs, their speed can really lead to a lot of production. And we saw that as well from McLaughlin. And heading into this season, you look at this backfield and there's not a lot here. Like there's a lot of guys getting some hype, like maybe Javante Williams after last year coming back from an injury and having a bad season. Maybe he can bounce back a fifth rounder and Audric Estime with kind of like a middling profile is he fast is he not we don't really know Blake Watson's getting some hype a veteran in Samaji P Ryan we're assuming that they're going to be cutting at least one maybe two of these guys I think Watson goes and I think a lot of people are expecting Samaji P Ryan to go but this is a veteran who can pass protect and pass catch that's valuable and I think Sean Payton might value that so they might keep four guys which makes this backfield even messier but if McLaughlin can continue to produce as the most efficient guy in this backfield and the offseason praise just continues for the guy this was this offseason in June you can see right here head coach basically saying that McLaughlin is getting into the weight room he's the first one here hitting the weight room that's what we need we need this guy to put on five to ten pounds 200 plus pounds would be great compared to 190 he's always in here an hour an hour and a half before everybody else and getting the work in so we get some praise there but then we get the obvious stuff right the practical stuff the coach speak that's not all flowers we have to get this right here he says the snap share this is another Broncos coach he says this year is going to depend on how he could fare in pass protection in training camp in the preseason this is the big thing we talked about this earlier with another running back in Kamani Vidal when you're any running back especially a younger guy a rookie a second year player and you're a little bit smaller you have to pass protect so we kind of have to fingers crossed hope that he went from 190 pounds closer to 200 or at least improved his ability to pass protect so there are still a lot of things that we have to check here there's a lot of running backs in this backfield we have to hope that he can pass protect this season enough for them to trust him but that's exactly why he goes as the 155th player off the board in round 13 or 14 that's why he's not going in round five if we knew that this guy was 200 pounds and a great pass protector he'd be a fifth round pick a sixth round pick based on his efficiency numbers you're getting a nice discount on him because there are some questions we can address those questions and say that there's a, a chance that he can still come through now i thought this was a good tweet there's just some highlight videos on twitter below this but the og i think it's theo maybe theo og the og fantasy football he basically compares Jaleel mclaughlin to Jalen warren they were both udfas who had legit upside and juice we saw that last year and then you can see the jump for warren in his two years 28 receptions to 61 so even if it's not a full-time role right because it wasn't a full-time role for Jalen warren last year but he still finishes a top 30 running back because Najee harris was there even if it's not a full-time role you could see McLaughlin be that efficient back like a Jalen Warren earn more receptions which are highly valuable valuable in fantasy football yards
yards after the catch is higher than yards per carry just generally speaking you have more open space that's where he can come through now before we get into my favorite tight end who goes right around that around 10 11 12 range right in there that has league winning upside i gotta tell you something i see so many of you have been signing up for the fantasy blueprint and it makes sense with your fantasy leagues coming if you're not familiar do you want to win your fantasy league this question right up here if it sounds like you you click this button and you'll have multiple options to get my risk-free fantasy blueprint which has all the tools and analysis that you'll need to win your fantasy draft dominate that and then every single week of the year you'll get tools and you can sign up risk-free this year through our two partners below there's also a third option down here just in case those don't work for you on the off chance you can just click this here and now remember i said it's risk-free a qr code will come up on the screen somewhere around me right now or you can click the link in the description below to get it it's risk-free because if you don't make your fantasy playoffs the ten dollar deposit that it takes through one of our partners i just give that right back to you no questions asked you get the ten dollars right back if you don't make the fantasy playoffs and you can use the tools all year long so if you want to join the over ten thousand people who have used and are currently using the fantasy blueprint for this year and i see tons of people every single day dozens of people grabbing it now the drafts are getting closer just scan the qr code on the screen or click the link in the description below to get access today now that tight end that i was talking about is pat fryermuth he's my favorite tight end in that like round 10 to 12 range right now and look here's the deal he's been getting hyped up all offseason long in otas and practices he's basically the number one winner of the steelers offseason so far because you can see right here he had an instant connection with russell wilson and came across as a potential playmaker in arthur smith's tight end heavy offense what is a tight end heavy offense you can go back to the days with arthur smith the new offensive coordinator for this team when he was with the titans he had guys like john smith breaking out you can go back to the days the last two years with kyle pitts and john smith last year in atlanta even though they didn't live up to the expectations kyle pitts he was still heavily used now from a strategy standpoint you can see pat fryermuth currently goes 130th he's going in like round 11 sometimes he falls to round 12 and a strategy standpoint if we talked about this in our previous video the number one uh fantasy football um strategy for 2024 you can see that there's guys that i think are worth targeting at the tight end position kyle pitts himself in like round five you can see up here evan ingram in like round five or six as well even if you wanted to go to a david and joku in like round nine or ten i think those guys are all great but if you miss out on those ranges the latest i think you can go and still get a league winning upside type player is a pat fryermuth who you can gratefully get in round 11 or 12 now quickly people might identify that are looking into things or were a steelers fan last year or owned them in fantasy that yeah he didn't have a great season in 2023 mr pat fryermuth but we can point to a couple of reasons for this add some context the player profiler injury history you can see right here he had an undisclosed injury to start the season and then as soon as week four he gets a hamstring injury a hamstring injury at the very least is going to probably take two to four weeks to get fully back up to steam in many situations it can take six to eight weeks and this is exactly what it did he misses five games if he's missing five games and it's on the injury report for six games my guess is that he probably still came back a week or two early from this injury if not earlier and kind of played with a little bit of fatigue or mental or physical pain or sort of discomfort and limiting factors i think he probably wasn't healthier for at least eight to ten weeks of the season and then you have to factor in that he had pretty terrible quarterback play last year from kenny pickett to mitch trubisky to mason rudolph they were terrible over 25 percent of his targets weren't even catchable so all that stinks you're playing banged up with terrible quarterbacks who are not throwing accurate passes and oh yeah you only had two touchdowns when the average tight end who's playing as much as he is running as many routes as he is is a big body in the middle of the field should have more than this but the offense was just that bad so all this factored together the games that he left early with injury kind of skewing his fantasy points per game down puts him at the 27 tight end overall last season meaning some people might just look at this and go i don't want anything to do with that i think that is a massive mistake because this guy went on the field was out there for 77 percent of the routes and keep in mind this is on a per game basis so he left some of those games early and got injured this number is probably more likely closer to 80 to 85 percent if he was fully healthy last season so instead of ranking 20th he's probably borderline top 10 in this category and that's important because now arthur smith like we said is the offensive coordinator and he's going to use his tight end he did with kyle pitts last year and now he gets a little bit of an upgrade at the quarterback position is it the biggest upgrade in the world probably not is it an upgrade though i would say definitely over those guys we mentioned earlier and like i mentioned earlier kyle pitts a guy who has not paid off in fantasy because people have been taking him in the third fourth fifth rounds of draft sure that's not where you have to take pat fryermuth now keep this in mind Kyle Pitts last year 89 targets over five per game in that offense and this was with competition like a Drake London out there not that same type of alpha sure Kenny Pickett's there I don't view him as much of an alpha as Drake London if we're talking about competition now for Pat Frymuth and if you look at the overall target rate right here target rate targets per route run 19 percent if you got this for Pat Frymuth that would be absolutely fantastic the routes run were high for him 87 percent of the time you have Kyle Pitts running a route now he's more built like a receiver I don't think Pat Frymuth is these guys though did come out in the same draft these guys both were 
four, two of the best tight end, tight end, or tight end prospects in a while. So I do think you're getting a comparable player in terms of being able to catch passes and produce in fantasy. And now you're just getting him rounds later than Kyle Pitts went in an Arthur Smith offense. And the reason I think it's at least worth mentioning is because George Pickens is the only serious threat for targets right now. And he even has his questions. Can he transition to a guy who wins over the field more as opposed to the outside? They have a third round rookie in Roman Wilson, who I think has some upside, can be a slot hybrid player. But then Van Jefferson, Calvin Austin, Quez Watkins, guys who have never Denzel Mims and Scotty Miller. I mean, this is just a definition of like castaway players that had high hopes on other teams and just never came through, which is why I do think a guy like Pat Fryermuth could be the primary option in the middle of the field, in the short area of the field for these new quarterbacks. All right, now before we get into these next running backs who somehow go after round 10 and have a ton of upside, I just want to say over 60% of you are still not subscribed to this channel. It's getting very close to being in the 50s though. I keep looking, but my goal is by September 1st to have that to be 50% of the people who watch this be subscribed. It takes two seconds. I know people forget, but I just want to give you that little urge right now because again, it only takes two seconds and it truly does help this channel a ton. Let's me get out more content, the bigger our profile grows. Now the first running back I want to talk about, I kind of cheated a little here, guys. Look at this right here. Jerome Ford, he goes 115th overall. I know my criteria was round 10 or after, meaning he has to go 120th, but depending on the format you're playing in, he goes outside the top 100 on certain websites that I'm looking at like ESPN on Yahoo sometimes. This is just the overall ADP when we factor in places like um, Underdog where maybe some running backs can go uh, at different ranges of the draft depending on the build that people are going for. But overall right now, he goes 115th overall. I do think you can probably get him a little bit later depending on when you're drafting and there's a lot to like. Immediately you might say like, uh, Jerome Ford, can I even remember what he did last year? Well, just a little refresher. He was on the Cleveland Browns and saw basically the starting usage for a big part of the season because one Nick Chubb last year, he got injured. And if you want to scroll, we can scroll here on player profile to that injury. It was one of the most gruesome injuries you'll ever see. He dislocated his knee. He tore his MCL. He tore his ACL. He tore his, I believe, meniscus as well. He had a four injuries in one to a leg that he already injured with a similar injury in college. Not great. Right now, he's not going to be ready for the preseason. He's probably going to start the season on the PUP list. That's at least four missed games. And a lot of people are starting to talk in the Browns camp when you interview the coaches. Like they might not even have this dude all year the way that they're preparing. And like I said, he had a similar injury in college and now he has over 1,300 NFL touches on his back. I mean, I'm rooting for this guy to get back. If you really want to draft him in your draft right now because he goes later, go for it. But I think there's a serious chance that we don't see Nick Chubb until week seven, week eight. And even when we do, he's not getting a full workload maybe ever this season. And the guy that's going to benefit the most from that is the guy who was there last year and found success in Jerome Ford. But despite quite possibly being the number one running back on a Cleveland Browns team that led the league in plays per game last year and has a top five offensive line, he still goes in round 10 or so right now, late in round nine of drafts. And I just think there's a lot of upside here when he's going after guys somehow like Jamison Williams and Blake Corn. Now I mentioned he got to play a lot of games last year. He played in all 17 games. And last season, he actually finished as a top 25 running back. He scored nine times a top 25 running back despite being kind of just thrown into things. If you look at his overall production, not too bad. Over 1,100 total yards between his rushing and receiving was factored in both areas with his, you see right here, 44 receptions, pretty solid numbers for a starting running back. And this was while splitting the backfield at times with like Kareem Hunt and some other guys that got brought into the fold. But all the talk right now is that the Browns trust Jerome Ford even more than they did last year and that he's improving even more than last year, which means he might be able to take on even more of a workload. And this is a similar screen that we showed for one Deshaun Watson because the offensive line is improved. They lost three key pieces last year to seasoning ending injuries. The biggest pieces were Jedrick Willis and Jack Conklin, probably their two best offensive linemen. They didn't have these guys for a chunk of the year last year. Now they're going to have them. So the offensive line is only going to get better. If you're blocking better and picking up more yards before contact for a guy in Jerome Ford, that's only going to help your overall production and fantasy outlook. Plain and simple, this Browns offense other Kevin Stefanski, all he wants to do is run. He wants to set up the play action. He wants to set up the deception. And a guy like Jerome Ford is good enough to be able to do that, even if we got just what we got from him last year. And we have had some nice words this offseason, this overall this summer. You can see right here a video from the Coach Speak Index. Kevin Stefanski was on a uh, news anchor, and they basically just say with Nick Chubb, will obviously let him rehab, and when he's ready, they don't really have a timeline. But he basically goes on to say, not any other running backs in this backfield, not Deontay Foreman, a guy that they signed a veteran. He says, I think Jerome Ford has done a nice job, really, really big moments for our football team, and made a lot of big plays. So excited about that. He didn't take this time to say anything about a newcomer and Deontay Foreman. He basically just said, Jerome Ford, Jerome Ford, Jerome Ford, which is why I'm saying Jerome Ford, Jerome Ford, Jerome Ford in round 10 or so of drafts right now is pretty appealing. If you get your early round running back and then you start to target your second or third or fourth running backs in that round seven to 10 range, I think Ford should be one of those options. And with that, we get to another running back now who goes after round 10 in round 11. And it's Zach Charbonnet, a player that we've talked about in the past, because right now in round 11 of drafts, I think there's some serious league winning upside for him. Because let's just look at the build of this player. You get a six foot, 214 pound running back. You can see right here, entering his second year as a former second round pick that the team traded up for with solid athletic testing numbers. Good burst, 78th percentile, well above average. Speed is very quality for his size, a 4.53 40 time, that's 70th percentile. 
percentile. These are nice elements. Now, the one main concern and the reason why people would push back immediately is because of the backfield that he's in. Kenneth Walker has been on this team, a former second round pick in, in his own right for two years. He's averaged over 1,100 yards per season. There's no real reason to think that he'd be phased out because here's the deal. Zach or uh, Kenneth Walker has been a quality player. So how in the heck people are telling me now they're reaching out and saying, Sal, if Kenneth Walker is there, a good running back, how is Zach Charbonnet going to pay off? Well, one metric right here I want to point to receptions in college, his final year, 37 catches, as good as you'll see for a college running back doesn't sound like a lot, but they don't play as many games or use running backs. And then in his rookie season last year, in a part-time role where he played less than 50% of the snaps, he has 33 receptions, 27th amongst the running back position. He's above his own backfield running back and Kenneth Walker in this area. This is a guy who can pay off with receptions alone. And then you factor in his 50 to 100 plus 50 care, 150 carries even that he can earn on the ground this year. And that's where you start to see him in round 13, be a potential league winner for you. Charbonnet is the best pass catching running back on this team for an offense that has Ryan Grubb who wants a now a new that's their offensive coordinator the new offensive coordinator he wants to throw the ball more that's what he did in college last year at Washington go three wide receivers running back in the backfield and use that running back in the receiving game and then if there was a chance that Kenneth Walker was to miss time like he did for about two to two and a half games last season that's where the true upside for Charbonnet comes in in those three games last year when Walker did miss time you had Charbonnet averaging 75 yards per game on 20 touches per game and 13.2 fantasy points per game so that's solid production for a rookie who wasn't in the best offense for his skill set and now he is and not to mention the offensive line there's been a lot of changes they lost Damian Lewis they lost Evan Brown this would be my biggest concern if I had a point went out but they did add in so many offensive linemen this offseason you can see right here four offensive linemen in free agency George Faint uh, Lincoln Thomas and Nick Harris they signed Christian Haynes in the draft they get a couple of guards in the NFL draft and a tackle so they brought in seven new offensive linemen to replace their two big losses we're hoping that some combination there can at least do enough to still be a league average or even better uh, offensive line for these backs but honestly if the offensive line isn't good maybe we get a situation where geno smith doesn't have time and he's checking down to his pass catching running back a la a Derek carr checking down so many times to alvin kamara last year and that's where jack charbonnet again can benefit so these are the guys who go later in drafts round 10 or after that i do think are hidden gems and do have some league winning upside but if you want to see the must-have players that are going earlier in drafts but they are must have at the running back and wide receiver position check out these lovely videos right over here and let me know in the comments any of the feedback that you have on this video